Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar of the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and welcome to Living Divine Mercy here on the EWTN Network, the show that brings you teachings of Divine Mercy, as well as reading in Scripture and the Diary of St. Faustina about mercy, and most of all, the stories of people inspiring us to live mercy in our lives. You know, Christianity is the biggest religion in the world today, and within that, we have both Catholics and Protestants, non-Catholic Christians. But did you know that there are more Catholics than all those other Protestant Christian denominations combined? All 40,000. There are more Catholics than all those combined. So yes, there are over 1 billion Catholics in the world making up the church. But each of us Catholics is also living in one of the millions of little domestic churches in the world, and that is what we call the family. So why do we call the family this anyway? Because the family, like at a church, is supposed to set aside time to revere and worship God. You know, Benedict XVI said, quote, Every home is called to become a domestic church in which family life is completely centered on the lordship of Christ and the love of husband and wife mirrors the mystery of Christ's love for the church, his bride, end quote. You know, in his encyclical Evangelium Vitae, the Gospel of Life, Jean Paul II also says, quote, as the domestic church the family is summoned to proclaim, celebrate, and serve the gospel of life. As babies are born and families grow, the parents, considered the first and foremost educators by the church, are called to pass on the Catholic faith to their children. This is the domestic church, end quote. And St. Mother Teresa said, quote, the best and surest way to learn the love of Jesus is through the family. So parents, please just don't count on the catechism teacher one hour a week to teach your kids about God. You have the responsibility to impart the faith to your children. In fact, Catechism 1666 says, the Christian home is the place where children receive the first proclamation of the faith. For this reason, the family home is rightly called the domestic church. Here, one learns about virtue, forgiveness, and most of all, divine worship in prayer, end quote. Amazing. And we thought we were simply teaching our kids how to share, how to be potty trained, to stop fighting, and how to avoid all the dangers in life. While these things, yes, are important, these earthly things, we can't forget about the heavenly things. You know, Catholic parents have the awesome responsibility of raising their children to not only learn right from wrong, but to recognize that the real purpose of their lives in this world is to work out their salvation in the next world. This has to be the number one priority in raising children. To help pave the way to heaven for their children, it's essential for you parents to establish an atmosphere of prayer in the home yourself to help your family focus more on the sacred rather than just the secular, you must bring something of the big church into your home, the little domestic church. So keep that spirit of Christ alive in your home all week long, not just on Sundays. In fact, dinner time, for example, is not just about filling our bellies. It's a time to grow together as a family. Introducing prayer at the dinner table is not only beneficial, it's essential, and it may be the only time you actually have a captive audience to do it. And if you do, your family can become a beacon of light in this dark world. You know, also do things like having your home blessed, do a family consecration, or practice beautiful Catholic devotions. Now, we know that many domestic churches are headed by just one parent, um, or maybe there is even a marriage of mixed faiths, but they can still be effective. To hand down the amazing gift of faith to the family, we can start with our own example and reflecting upon how we personally are living our faith in our own lives. 
You know, St. Paul speaks of the church and the churches, how they at his time met in individual homes. And in these same homes, he instructed them all to be baptized, even the children. Yes, infant baptism. So please have your children baptized. That's the best way for you to be a good parent in handing on your faith. Now, by being baptized, the divine, so why is this so? Because by being baptized, the divine life fills the home, which means the household takes on an ecclesial or churchly dimension. And in today's world full of broken families, we need this. And that's why we need a lot of help. So let's invoke the intercession of the Holy Family to help us keep our families together. Now we want to share a story with you about a town that you would not believe still exists today. Maintaining family values, practicing their faith, and loving each other makes this story show the domestic church come alive. You know, this is a true stat. Over 95% of the town is Catholic and over 90% actively practice their faith. Incredible. This is unheard of today. And keep in mind that what you are about to see is a public, not a private, high school. Yes, there still is hope for our future and our youth of today. This is Westphalia, Michigan. The farmland here is rich and fertile. And so is this unique community's faith with so many beautiful young families attending mass with their children. As you come into town, you just see how the church building just towers over everything else. And it's just a real sign of, of people's commitment to the faith. The families are very strong, so a lot of times the faith is passed on from generation to generation. Uh, when someone decides to take the faith more seriously or comes back to the faith, that's really celebrated in the town. So I just love how there are all kinds of supports for people trying to live out their faith. You know, we all need support. We all need strength. We all need help in living out our faith. And there's just so many supports around people in this town, and that's just, it's just a beautiful safeguard for our people. Family values are as much a part of Westphalia's identity as the dairy farms that dot the landscape. It's something that we almost take for granted that we live in a community of shared values. We have a shared faith. Uh, we believe in Jesus Christ. We all are in agreement that the domestic church is so important and it's a family first. And our families share our, our faith and, and share values. We've seen families from outside of our community move into our community because they want that faith for their family and they want to live in a community that shares those values. This is our third generation of our family farm. It's been in the family well over 100 years. I went to St. Mary's Elementary School. I also went to Piwama, Westphalia, graduated in 1982 from school there. Along with our generation of our three sons, they also went to St. Mary's, Westphalia and graduated Piwama, Westphalia. The families here and the faith that is here and the, the, just the common courtesy. It's like going back to the 1950s. The kids are still in trouble for running and running in the hallways and chewing gum. And, you know, I'm not going to say it's perfect, but it's, it's one of the nicest places I think you could ever raise a family. On Main Street, parishioners even pitched in to buy a bar and turned it into the Ark. They even built an adoration chapel inside where people, especially the youth, can come and live their faith. I mean, the bar was struggling financially, and so the, the opportunity came up to begin to rent the facility, and young people love food. I mean, who doesn't love food? Brought the gospel to life in a way that was like, just normal, just day-to-day -day life. You might order a burger or some fries and talk about what you just heard in the Bible study and then just socialize after. And so it, it was a natural fit. 
I think, unique in a lot of ways to what youth ministry was sort of characterized as back 20 years ago, was that we were distinctly Christ-centered. The reason the young people came was to find the meaning of life, and particularly in Christ. So we had a lot of kids who weren't even Catholic who were coming to this, who then became Catholic because they found Christ, they found life. We're, we're trying to build up the next generation of disciples, you know, where we're trying to help them. We see this as another avenue of sharing that faith, of passing it on, of creating new disciples and helping, helping them learn about Jesus' love for them. It's just giving them a place where they feel comfortable, a place where they can have fun um, without ever having to get caught up in everything else that's going on outside of the world. But we're definitely in a bubble in regards to our faith and that we have something very unique and something beautiful. So it's my goal to expand the bubble. Um, I think if we keep our faith here, we're not, we're not fulfilling our mission of the church, which is to go out, to create disciples, um, to share the gospel. And so the best way to do that is investing in your youth. Two, two, two! For years, giving glory to God through sport has captured the hearts of those who live here. Faith, family, and Friday nights when the football team is playing, everybody's there. But the community never forgets that faith is what wins, both on and off the field. The faith that you find out here in Westphalia is authentic. The one thing we tend to do sometimes is we have faith on Sunday, but not during the week, but not here. Our championships, our culture, it's all interwoven with their faith in God. And these kids, they're the ones that are requesting it. No one mandates this. These kids have faith on their own. I've noticed when I go to daily mass, the kids are in there. Some of the football players were in there. How do you win three state championships without faith? Faith shouldn't be just on a Sunday. Thankfulness should be given uh, every day, whether it is on the football field, whether it's you know, at the supper table, interaction of schools, accomplishments that come as children grow through their ages. We invest in our values like a strong work ethic, uh, being positive. Our domestic church lets its kids face adversity in school, and on the athletic field especially, and it lets kids work out those problems at an early age. Many of the players of this public school choose to find comfort and focus in adoration before each game. I would stress before a really big game, and usually our opening game was a really big game against a bigger school than us. So I would come down to adoration about two hours before, I would just say, God, I know that I just need to trust in you and that I'd always pray that no one gets seriously hurt. After that, I would go down to the, my uh, cemetery because my grandpa died in 2012 when I was in seventh grade. And he was like my biggest role model growing up. I would spend all the time with him. So I would always just tell him I want to make him proud and I'd play the game for him. I'm an anxious person, so before games, I had a lot of, you know, nervous, excited energy. So to me, you know, adoration was a place where I could calm down. I could, you know, release that energy and just say, you know, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm excited to play tonight. You know, let your will be done. I pray that, you know, I can just play to the best of my abilities that you gave me. All that matters right now is that that team came all the way over here to try to end your season on your field. And that's not going to happen. Nobody, and I mean nobody, comes into our place and pushes us around. The faith is just as strong come game time. In fact, student-led prayers of thanksgiving have a place in the locker room as well. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to come out here with this group of guys and play the game we all love so much. That idea of the, the students really taking ownership of it and wanting to come together and 
give thanks and to get themselves mentally right to go out there and play is uh, something that I think is pretty special. Uh, I think it's pretty unique. Uh, I love the fact that it is student-led, student-centered. They take it upon themselves to carve out some time, both before and after the game, to come together in prayer. So it's a, it's a really neat thing to see from a distance as a coach. Yeah, I think the prayer really puts us in a good mindset, you know, it puts everything into perspective and helps us to remember what's really important, you know, that God still is our number one, even though we love, you know, playing football and you can get really into it. Um, you know, the big picture stuff, it's all about our faith, so. Our public school staff doesn't promote a faith. It does promote values. And these aren't values specific to the Catholic faith or a Christian faith, but these values are shared. There's no question about it. In 2019, it wasn't just the state championship game that the girls' basketball team was thinking about. In fact, they were just as concerned about being able to schedule mass to be celebrated after their victory. Me, personally, I was going on the alternative spring break with a couple other girls on the team, and we were like, we were supposed to leave at 5 a.m., and our game was at or in the afternoon, so there's no way we can make it to 4.30 mass. So we were kind of like, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? Our initial thought was maybe we'll just like not go. Um, we got talking with the parents and we're like, maybe we can ask Father Eric if he could do a special mass for us. Sure enough, we contacted Father Eric and he was like, yeah, I would love to do that. Um, and it was honestly the perfect celebration after a state championship to give that appreciation and glory to God after such a big win and such hard work. It was, it was awesome. Because of our strong shared values, we do see a lot of students that are successful in high school and in college want to again come back to raise their families here in Westphalia. And there are certainly a lot of rural communities in the state of Michigan or across the country that struggle bringing back their best and brightest to raise their family. The brilliant new lady of Westphalia window at the front of St. Mary's was designed to summarize Westphalia, its people as Americans, as farmers and shop workers, and as a people of faith. There's also a scripture verse that summarizes and reflects this town's deep spiritual and family roots. When I think of this community, I, you know, maybe because of the fidelity that I see here of people trying to live it out. You know, maybe that from John 12, that unless the grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a grain. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Traditionally, this, this community has great agricultural roots. So I think that whole idea of the grain going into the ground and dying, and you, know, you just having to wait and trust that new life is coming, that really resonates, I think, with a lot of people out here. I, I think it can spur them on to faithfulness and can help them see the importance of faithfulness, of just continuing to trust, you know, when things are dormant, when things are in the ground, that, that God's got new beautiful things in store. To me, the Divine Mercy message is for the lay people as well, to spread it like a wildfire, because it's mercy in the days where there is lots of trauma going on in families everywhere. To all you guys here at PW, we give thanks to God for you guys coming together in true sportsmanship. We give thanks that you have survived another game to be able to bring forth glory to God. And let us pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. This message of mercy is personal and strong. That's what I would like to spend our life doing, is being a part of this message, helping the Stockbridge Marians any way that we can to spread this message. And I think in Westphalia, they found a friend.
What an amazing story of a town that actually still exists in today's world. And did you also notice with those high school kids, they were actually talking to one another and not buried in their cell phones. Again, quite amazing. Now, I do have to say one thing, however. You know, the Pirates lost only one regular season football game in five years. And yes, that one loss was to no other than my former high school football team, Catholic Central in Monroe. So had to add that. So congratulations to the Pirates who just won again the 2021 Michigan State Football Championship. Now let me introduce you to a special Miriam priest in my heart, Father Mark, because he was my novice master when I first came to the Marians, charged with forming me into becoming a priest. All I remember is him saying, rejoice in your lack. But one thing I can say about Father Mark, he sure has zeal. This is Father Mark Barron. Prior to the age of 18, I never thought once about being a priest. When I was going through high school, I had a, a desire or a goal to attend Notre Dame University. So I decided to run to become the religious chairman of my senior class, or really the religious chairman of the school. During the middle of my senior year, Father John Dietrich, the chaplain, I was in his office and he just asked me if I ever thought about being a priest. And my initial response was kind of like shock and in one sense trauma. It's kind of like, no, I never thought about being a priest. But when he did say that, it was kind of like God kind of opened my heart and planted the seed there. And then I went to college and it was first semester of my freshman year and all of a sudden this thought about being a priest came again to my mind and I started thinking about it and as soon as I started thinking about it again it was like I got this kind of like what I call a mystical warm fuzzy that kind of confirmed for me that I don't know how or when this is going to happen but I'm, I'm going to end up being a priest. I first um, pursued the Diocese of Louisville, Kentucky, and I didn't feel like that that was the right fit for me. And I didn't feel like really any other diocese was a fit for me. And so I kind of, um, in that way, started to pursue religious communities. And I ended up with the Marians um, really through Fatima. So I went on this pilgrimage to Fatima. I went down and made a holy hour asking the Lord, what did you want me to do? So that holy hour down there turned into an all night prayer vigil. So when I got back, I couldn't really sleep. And I felt this hunger to go back to the English speaking mass. I, I went there for that 10.30 a.m. English speaking mass. And all of a sudden the procession of priests starts in. And I noticed that the chaplain for our pilgrimage was, he was in the celebration line. I'm like, oh, that's kind of weird. I, I thought he was gonna be the main celebrant. So, um, the main celebrant steps up to the altar and he introduces himself. Good morning. My name is Father Michael Scanlon from Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. And this is the first time that I've ever celebrated Mass here at Fatima. I'm glad to be here. I'm like, oh wow, that's a song. So immediately after Mass, I went uh, to the sacristy and I, and I met, Father, met Father Mike. And I said, Father Mike, I said, I want to come to your university, but I don't have the money. He said, well, just write me and, and I'll see if I can help you out. So, so I get back and I write him and he says, I can give you free room and board. So I went to Franciscan for that year and they always have a vocation awareness day. So I remember walking in that day and I remember one of the first things I saw was an image of Divine Mercy and an image of Our Lady. And of course, at that time in my life, I had a great devotion to both of those. And so when I saw it, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a community that seemed to promote Divine Mercy and Our Lady. And probably over a year and a half discernment, uh, I finally decided that I thought this was a good place for me to enter, and I did, and uh, really haven't looked back since. Now let's hear in Scripture about why we do not want to be lukewarm souls. We want to be like those we just saw in Westphalia. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were cold or hot. So, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. 
What is a lukewarm soul? It is not the person whose prayer feels cold, lacking the warmth of divine love, nor is it someone who is emotionally exhausted, who feels dead inside in the midst of grief. Souls suffering like this are simply feeling as if God is far away. Being lukewarm is not a feeling. It is an attitude and habit in which a baptized person, day after day, chooses Christian mediocrity and moral compromise. Lukewarm souls decide for themselves which teachings of the church they will take seriously. They may pride themselves in going regularly to church, but their faith has little effect on how they live. St. Faustina prays earnestly for these souls because it is very hard for the Holy Spirit to melt their hearts and save them. She prays to Jesus, I bring lukewarm souls into the abode of your most compassionate heart. In this fire of your pure love, let these tepid souls who, like corpses, filled you with such deep loathing, be once again set aflame. O most compassionate Jesus, exercise the omnipotence of your mercy and draw them into the very ardor of your love, and bestow upon them the gift of holy love, for nothing is beyond your power. So finally, as we heard Lori say from Westphalia, the laity want to be a part of this mission of divine mercy. Do you know St. Faustina actually had a vision that she saw an association of the laity that helped spread divine mercy around the world and that God would help protect them for doing this great work. You too can be part of that. The association is the Marian Helpers. And please visit us at micprayers.org and become part of our Marian family and share in many graces. Takes but a second, doesn't cost anything, but you can help us spread mercy around the world. So thank you for joining us this week. And next week, we'll be talking about angels. So until then, may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.